right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Sierra Stopland, who is all the way up in North Dakota. How are you doing, Sierra? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thanks, absolutely. And I'm going to think maybe you're the first person from North Dakota we've had on this show. I'm Most thinking. likely, probably, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so um, so um, Sierra, you're the, the coach, the Boutique Workshop, um, and the founder of Boutique Box, the original wholesale subscription box for boutique owners. And what we're going to talk about today is from selling rocks to selling a business, the journey of an entrepreneur. So... How did selling the rocks go? Well, my mom made me return them. So it, <laughs> that business was not very successful, um, but it did. Yeah, it did just give that me, give me that entrepreneurial fire of, you know, what, what would it look like to turn something into value? So there was a mm. lesson learned. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of rocks were they? Just picked out from my mother's garden. She was a fabulous gardener. And she had all sorts of rocks, big rocks, little rocks, you know, and when you're little, you put a little water on a rock and it's gorgeous. You think it's yeah. worth a lot. And so I thought, you know what, I think our neighbors would love these. So door to door, I went with my sister and my little red wagon and we knocked and our, our neighbors were gracious enough to give me nickels and quarters. And then mom made me take it all back. So. <laughs> <laughs> love it <laughs> so that was so that got you that got the bug of the of being an entrepreneur obviously at an early age but um tell me about building and selling a business because I think that's be fascinating for people to understand the progression of that yeah for sure so um I'm a serial entrepreneur I've had several businesses and when I made my way through my last large business venture was retail um, I decided I wanted to build something and sell it. So I started with that end in mind, which I think is really important. If you're looking at building something to sell it, think about the end at the beginning, because we don't do that a lot as entrepreneurs. We just try to live in the moment. We try to make sure that we survive every day. But if we can keep thinking about what do we want the end to look like and then back into that, that really gives a filter for decision making and just the way that you pivot and grow and, um, and move in your business. Yeah, no, I think that's a great piece of advice. And obviously, you know, what you're thinking of can can change over time. But to your point is, I think, yeah, I think a lot of people go into a, a business venture just hoping to survive saying, yeah, I'd love this business right. to, to bloom and make lots of money, maybe I'll sell it, maybe I won't. But I think it's to survive. But I think that is an excellent point is to maybe just take that extra time to really figure out what do you want from the business in the long run. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So when I built the boutique box, the goal was to build it and sell it. And what was really interesting about that, and I hadn't done that in a previous business where I had really thought about the end, the exit strategy at the beginning, is when I was forced to make decisions on, you know, what type of platform, what type of marketing, what type of team member to bring in next. It gave me gave me that filter to say, okay, if I bring this team member in, is that going to get me closer to my goal, further away from my goal? Is that going to remove me so I'm not a necessary component, which is really important if you're looking to sell? Um, and so it was really interesting to just process through that. And I was able to build it and sell it within 18 months. Wow, wow. Yeah, but I think, uh, again, great advice, because I, I think maybe that's something that a lot of people maybe would overlook is the is the decisions that you make. Because obviously you want to make the business, if you decided that you want to sell it, you want the business to be as purchasable as possible without yes. as without any you know without any too many obstacles or problems and obviously that affects all the decisions you make leading up to that because you want a business that people can take pretty easily and and run right. as opposed to one that's going to take a lot of integration Yes, for sure. Yeah, you want to be able to build something that's plug and play, you know, that's going to be a much more attractive to a buyer, something that makes sense um, to fold into another portfolio. So thinking about is this business that I'm creating something that would, you know, there's enough market that someone would want to grab mm -hmm. that and put it in their portfolio. And then just really understanding that if you are so and if you're such an integral part to your business, it doesn't make it very attractive to a buyer. So I didn't want to, you know, to find a buyer and they say, well, it works Sierra because you're in it. I want mm -hmm. it to work whether or not I'm in it. And so just thinking about those things from the beginning really helps solidify processes and systems and things like that as well. 
Yeah, no, that's a, a, another excellent point because yeah, because that's what that's what often will happen. People say, yeah, I'm kind of interested in acquiring your business, but I'd like to tie you in for the next five right. years or something right. like that, or or put you know those dreaded golden handcuffs on you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and you know if that's something that you like, I want to build it and sell it and be part of it. That's another end, you know. And mm -hmm. so thinking about that, but if you're really looking to build something and just hand it off and move on, you want to make sure that you're setting it up properly for that type of exit. And I think, I mean, it's fair to say that nowadays uh, it's a lot easier to set up a business like that, obviously, given the technology, given the ease of, of contracting with, you know, different resources around the world. I mean, once upon a time, obviously, you know, you had to set up your business, like hire your people, get a, maybe get a building. On. There's lots of things. There's lots of parts of that that you don't need to do anymore. Or you can right. set it up in such a way as maybe maybe most of your resources are contracts. So therefore, if a bigger company wanted to buy what you had and slot it into their company, they could without too many too much effort. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was my goal when I built Boutique Box. Coming from retail, <laughs> I wanted to build a business with no leases, no loans, no inventory, and no employees. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so so how could I do that? And you can do so much with VAs um, and outsourcing your work with um, team members where they're not, you know, an actual W-2 employee. There's just so much we can do now, which is pretty exciting in the business space. Yeah. So you literally built a, a business in a box then? I did. I did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's the, the point is that, uh, is that is that going forward is that having that nimbleness and, and figuring out saying, OK, um, one of the things about business nowadays is it's getting very specialized in, in parts of it. And the fact is that if you hire somebody to do a specialized task, chances are you may not have enough work for that specialized task all the time. So what right. do you do? You turn them into a specialist plus a generalist, and then you lose the kind of their specialization and then they do a lot of other things in a very mediocre fashion. So yeah. that's why that's why being able to leverage external resources and being able to just uh, contract them for particular things, it's so much more effective. It really is. And that makes me think of something else too. If someone's thinking of building something that they can sell, being a disruptor, but yet not being so disruptive that it's not something that someone else would want to acquire. So we want to, we don't want to be so unique that someone says, well, I see no, you know, niche for that. I see no opportunity for that, but you want to be different enough that no one else has done it or they haven't done it the way that you're doing it. So that's always an interesting, you know, to find, find that, mm -hmm. um, that sweet spot, I guess, if you will. Yeah. And obviously then, to be able to demonstrate to the prospective purchasers that the you know the business that you've built can continue to build and grow um you know after your exit yes and that it's you know rec it, it can be um replicable yes that's what <laughs> i'm looking for a little tongue twister there um and that it can be um grown really quickly because most often when a buyer comes in they want something that can be ratcheted up fairly quickly as well <laughs> So what are some of the other considerations um, as, a, as you're building your business? What are some of the things that maybe surprised you that you needed to figure out before you could get the business ready to be sold? Yeah, so I think for me, um, it was interesting because what I was building was a subscription box, box for mm -hmm. boutique owners. So I had two different customers and it was a B2B concept. So that was interesting to figure out how to grow both sides of the business simultaneously because it was a subscription box business, but a wholesale subscription box. So how do you grow the, the customer that's buying into the subscription at the same time that you grow the supplier? Because if you're too quick on one side or the other, um, either or party doesn't want to buy into it. So that was a really interesting thing for me um, to just work through and process through. And then I'm very much like get in and do it on my own and try to figure it out. I wish that I would set have set up a more robust platform from the beginning. So I did a little bit too much DIY, which slowed down um, the growth process at the beginning. So that's something that I would do differently as well. Yeah, and I think then obviously the beauty nowadays is like with the advances in technology, I mean, there's platforms for everything. So, you know, basically, you know, doing your homework, uh, making sure the platform you select is the right one, making sure that the platform has some legs to it because right. there's lots of platforms appearing all the time. You want to make sure you make the, the right decision on that. And then I guess once you have that, you also then need to, as you said, you need to kind of share the knowledge so it doesn't all re um, reside in your head. 
Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, documenting your processes as you go along. Most entrepreneurs hate that. Like we're not detail people. <laughs> we don't want to document. Most, most everybody hates that except for right? those weird, weird, weird I people know. who love documenting. I know. There's not very many of us <laughs> of them. I should, I'm not included. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just documenting because it does really all live in your head as an entrepreneur. And that's something that a buyer doesn't want. They want to be able to buy something that like we talked about, it's plug and play, it's, you know, detailed out so that they can give it to their team and so forth and so on. So being able to get those things out of your head and onto paper as you go through the process of building is really important so that you're not finding yourself at the end and then trying to sit down and, you know, write it all out. So do it as you go. And for those maybe who are in, you know, either thinking about setting up their businesses or in the early stage of their business, um, tell me what, what were some of the what were some of the maybe obstacles or struggles you had at the beginning that maybe people could learn from? Yeah. So I would actually go back to my retail business, which I did before I, I built the boutique mm -hmm. box. Um, I didn't understand how important the numbers were. So I'm not a numbers person. I'm not an accountant. I'm not a bookkeeper. The thought of reading financials, like no interest in that um, kind of goes back to the details. And I learned the hard way, how important it is to understand your numbers as an entrepreneur and a business owner. And so that's something I did very differently when I built my next business. And now with the boutique workshop, that's what I teach um, to understand the fundamentals. You don't have to love your P&L, but you need to understand how to read it. And you need to understand what to do with the numbers when you're given them by your accountant or your bookkeeper. Um, so that's a big mistake that I, I didn't even know that that was important. Um, and I really try to emphasize that with all the small business owners that I visit with. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think sometimes people have a mental block towards, you know, P&Ls and all of that, if that's not what your, if that's not your forte. Um, but the reality is, uh, once you learn how to understand the P&L, you understand what your bookkeeper, your accountant, if you get them to take you through it, or you go to do a course like with you or whatever, it's never as hard as people imagine it is. It's actually right. quite straightforward. It is. And it's really, it really gets to be fun because yeah. they're just pieces of the puzzle. And once you have that information, you can have so much power to grow, to change, to make decisions with confidence. Um, so it gets to be a pretty fun game that you can play with yourself and your business once you really know what you're looking at. Yeah. And I think the other thing too is, you know, often, obviously the biggest struggle you have as a, as an entrepreneur or small business owner at the beginning is ensuring that you have the capital to sustain yourself over you know, a certain period of time, but that period of time generally always tends to be a bit longer than you would like it to be. Absolutely. So I, so I, yeah. And I think also sometimes people forget about the different, you know, the difference between revenue and cash flow. And, you know, they think, well, I've started off, I've got these contracts. It's fantastic. Everything is going well. You say, yeah, but none of them have paid you yet. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm actually just working through that right now, teaching profit first. Um, and that's exactly what we talk about because it doesn't matter the size of your business if the business isn't healthy. And if you don't know what type of numbers to look at, sometimes you just don't know if your business is healthy and it might feel healthy because you have a lot of cash in your bank account. Cause you just had an amazing launch or sale, but where's that cash going? And are you paying yourself and saving for yourself? That's really the true test of a health, healthy business. Yeah. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's where that, that's that's where it's worth the investment early on is to learn about the numbers and to learn about things like, you know, how to how to know whether your business is healthy or not and understand all your echo and just all that detail stuff that can save you a lot of headaches because there's really nothing can. worse, is there? There's nothing worse than you go look one day and you think, well, I've got loads of money. And then the next day, where did all that money go? Right. And we do it. And then we live on this roller coaster as entrepreneurs. Of, like, I love my business. This is great. And then I hate my business. I want to be done. And a lot of that is just cash management. Yeah. So just, so just on that, how would you advise people, particularly in early stages, maybe if they're getting a bit disheartened, maybe if it's getting a bit, maybe it's a little harder than they imagined it is, because it always is, let's face it. As I said, maybe it's taken a little longer than they would like. What, what's, your, what's your advice, your encouragement? Yeah, I think first of all, um, it's really important to get connected with a good mentor. And I don't throw that out there flippantly. You know, we hear a lot of like, oh, have a mentor, have a coach, but really have a good mentor. Look for someone that's been there and done that in the same industry or field that you're in and just ask them for 30 minutes of their time connect with them, come with questions, be prepared. Um, you want to be connected with people that are two, three, four steps ahead of you. That's huge. Cause they can point out, Hey, 
I didn't do this. Let's, let's spare you that heartache. <laughs> think mm -hmm. about this things that we don't know about if we don't ask. So I would think, um, I think that's my number one piece of advice is find a mentor, connect with someone that really can give you words of wisdom and challenge you when we get too optimistic in our business. We need those people that say, Hey, let's slow down. Think mm -hmm. about it this way. I'm not saying no, I'm just saying, wait for a couple seconds here. Yeah. Same person who can pick you up when you're like, what am I doing here? Why yes. did I do this? <laughs> Why did I even Absolutely. start this? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. No, excellent. No, I do think. And, and again, I mean, I think, uh, you know, nowadays, I guess with technology, I mean, it's much easier to have a find and have a mentor because, you know, they don't even have to be in the same place as you. But yes. I, I do think that's an incredibly important piece because it's very lonely then, isn't it? Otherwise. It is. It's very lonely to be an entrepreneur. And, you know, even if you have really supportive friends and family, they don't live in it 24 seven like you do. And they want to help you and support you. But it, there's something really special about connecting with other business owners who say, I absolutely know how you feel right now. Here's what we can do. Here's what I did. Let's walk through it together. Um, just having that empathetic ear is really important for growth. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and and having that kind of third party dispassionate one, because, yeah, family and friends are great. Um, but sometimes like there's too much emotion wrapped up in right. in there in that in that to, uh, you know, that it can it can overwhelm the advice, if you like. Yes. Yes. Nice and, to have an objective ear. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes we just don't like to take advice from our family members. Anyway. We don't. No. <laughs> <laughs> so what is so what um what is one other um last piece of advice that you're you would give to anybody who's who's doing trying to do what you did and set up your business for for selling it and and uh, taking care of all the details as you go along yeah you know i think pay yourself there's something really powerful about earning money in reward for work that's completed. And as entrepreneurs, we are always the last to pay ourselves, right? We pay our vendors, we pay our customers, we keep adding team members. And I did this same thing. I had a team of 12 and I wasn't paying myself. I had a seven figure biz, you know, business and wasn't writing myself a paycheck. Cause I kept thinking my payday will come. We hear this, you know, reinvest your payday will come. Take a paycheck from the beginning. Even if it's $50 a week, $150 a month, even if it's teeny tiny, be consistent with it, start small and just dedicate. You would never ask someone else to work for you for free and you know your paycheck will come in five years. Um, so don't ask yourself to do that because we soon become really bitter with our business and it's really hard to be a visionary and be excited and grow when we're constantly working for free. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic piece of advice because yeah, the last thing you want to do is start growing the business and then get bitter about the fact that everybody else is getting paid and you're not. Right, and you and will, the, you will. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, and yeah, that uh, waiting for the payday that can get old very fast. It can, yes, absolutely. Right. Well, especially if you go back to the people, maybe your significant other, maybe your kids, and all are going, hey, you know, when's the money coming? That's right. You're and <laughs> you're dedicating all this time. We don't see you. We don't get you know. Yeah. yeah. When are you getting your paycheck? So, yeah, exactly. And really we don't important. get to buy, and you don't even buy us stuff to buy off our infect. Our right. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no, I think that's fantastic. A uh, great piece of advice. Um, okay, so all of Sierra's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Absolutely. So, like I mentioned, I'm a third generation entrepreneur. I love small business. Um, I work specifically with inventory based businesses. Um, but you know, I help other businesses as well, but if you have inventory product, that sneaky little inventory number, how does it fit in? How do you always have enough money to buy inventory? All those good things. I love talking about it. So, um, you can find me at the boutique workshop.com or Sierra Stockland.com. And, um, I have a group coaching program, a mastermind program, and I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and consulting as well. Excellent. Well, listen, thanks again for today. Some fantastic advice there for entrepreneurs and small business owners, uh, and I would encourage you to check out Sierra's work. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you.